Muchas gracias, Paloma. Muy buenos días a todas y todos. Welcome to Coneval, profesor Gordon. Eh, la verdad es que estamos muy contentos en Coneval de tener la oportunidad de escuchar al profesor. Eh, en realidad, y usted lo sabe muy bien, el pasado 5 de agosto presentamos el informe de 10 años de la pobreza multidimensional que por normatividad y encargo tenemos que elaborar desde Coneval y justo eh, es parte de un cierre de esta primera etapa de esta medición de 10 años que creemos y consideramos y cuando me lo planteó el doctor Fernando Cortés, nuestro consejero académico que venía a, a nuestro país, el profesor Gordon, nos pareció muy adecuado eh, enmarcar en esta celebración, llamémoslo de esta manera, de la medición de 10 años, pues qué mejor que tener aquí en Coneval y escuchar una muy interesante ponencia sobre el enfoque multidimensional de la medición de pobreza que ha desarrollado el profesor Gordon en los últimos años. Ya que desde Coneval consideramos, sin lugar a dudas, muy relevante y muy importante el continuo diálogo y la continua retroalimentación que se pueda generar con la parte de la academia. Además, el profesor Gordon ha acompañado de manera muy relevante e importante todo el desarrollo teórico y metodológico de la medición multidimensional de la pobreza. Ustedes también deben de recordarlo muy bien. Parte de las cinco propuestas finales que Coneval planteó justo en el momento de la génesis del desarrollo de la medición multidimensional de la pobreza para nuestro país, una de esas cinco propuestas finales fue la que, de manera muy generosa, académicamente hablando, proporcionó y planteó el profesor Gordon a Coneval. Entonces, sin lugar a dudas, consideramos que parte, elementos relevantes de esa propuesta del profesor Gordon están en implícita y explícitamente en nuestra medición multidimensional de la pobreza que reitero pues ya tenemos 10 años de haber hecho de manera muy puntual, de manera muy sistemática, de manera muy coherente la publicación bianual de estos resultados. Entonces a partir de ahí consideramos que evidentemente hay retos, hay eh, todavía ventanas de oportunidad para tener un mayor enriquecimiento del análisis de esta medición multidimensional que podemos desde Coneval ir eh, elaborando en las siguientes mediciones. Si bien ya tenemos una base muy sólida, teóricamente, metodológicamente y empíricamente muy fuerte de la medición multidimensional, evidentemente siempre hay áreas de oportunidad que podemos ir eh, retomando y obteniendo mayores y análisis muy enriquecedores en las siguientes mediciones. Eh, reitero la más cordial bienvenida, profesor Gordon. En realidad es un gran placer tenerlos con todos nosotros y estamos convencidos desde Coneval que va a ser una ponencia con una temática bastante interesante y que nos dejará muchas ideas para reflexionar en las siguientes semanas. Muchas gracias por estar aquí, eh, profesor Gordon. Gracias. Bueno, antes de pasar directamente a la, a la presentación del doctor Gordon, me gustaría compartir con ustedes una muy breve semblanza. El doctor Gordon ha dedicado más de 30 años de su vida al análisis de la pobreza, en los que ha escrito o editado alrededor de 200 libros, reportes y artículos al respecto. Actualmente es profesor investigador de justicia social, así como director del Centro de Investigación sobre la Pobreza Internacional, Peter Townsend, y el Instituto de Pobreza en la Universidad de Bristol en el Reino Unido. Fue miembro del Grupo de Río de Expertos en Estadísticas de Pobreza de la Organización de las Naciones Unidas, contribuyendo al compendio de mejores prácticas en la medición de pobreza. Ha sido asesor del Departamento de Asuntos Económicos y Sociales de la ONU, el Fondo de las Naciones Unidas para la Infancia, la Organización Mundial de la Salud, la Unión Europea y de los gobiernos del Reino Unido, Gales y Nueva Zelanda en términos de medición de pobreza. Entre 2006 y 2009, como ya nos recordaba eh, nuestro secretario ejecutivo, el doctor Gordon participó como asesor internacional para el desarrollo de la metodología para la medición multidimensional de la pobreza del Coneval y desde entonces ha acompañado críticamente su evolución y sus resultados. Le agradecemos mucho que esté con nosotros.
Buenos dias. Uh, I'm going to talk in English because my Spanish is too terrible to inflict upon you. Uh, yes, I feel greatly honoured to uh, be here and I'm amazed at the number of people who have come, so thank you very much. When I first uh, had the honour of working with Conival, it was in a different building and maybe there were 20 or 30 staff. Uh, look at you now, what a, what a success. Yeah? <laughs> so I'm going to uh, talk about uh, 10 years of multidimensional poverty measurement in Mexico and some of the challenges and perspectives that brings. Uh, sorry. Is this? Okay. So, as you know, uh, the multidimensional measure of poverty in Mexico is uh, mandated in the uh, general law of social development. And uh, this has been amended over time, and so it now uh, has nine major indicators. Per capita income, uh, an education gap at household level, although in practice it's measured at the individual level, access to health services and social security, the characteristics of the dwellings, access to basic uh, services for the dwelling, water, sewerage, access to food, which has now been amended to be access to nutritious and good quality food, the level of social cohesion, and most recently, access to paved roads. And as you are aware, uh, the measure takes an intersectional approach. So you are considered to be multidimensionally poor if your household income is below the low income threshold and if you are deprived of one or more of your social and constitutional, social and economic rights as is written in the Constitution. So, the Mexican multidimensional poverty was not only innovative, it was a very, very strong measure. When Mexico implemented a multidimensional poverty measure based on fulfillment of social and con economic rights in the Constitution, it was the first country in the world to do this. Very few countries was there a discussion of multidimensional poverty. So Conival's work is not just known within Mexico, it has been a tremendous influence internationally. As I said in 2010, there was very little discussion. By 2015, because of the work of Conival and some other organizations like UNICEF, the governments of the world agreed at the sustainable, to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals. The primary goal is to eradicate poverty and part of that goal is to reduce by half poverty in all its dimensions, multidimensional poverty. So the world has followed Mexico's example in looking at poverty multidimensionally and having time limited specific targets to reduce that poverty by half in the next decade. That would not have happened without the work of you and all of your colleagues and that is a tremendous success. So, the law is designed to guarantee the full exercise of the social rights in the Constitution. The Mexican Constitution is taken as the embodiment of the will of the Mexican people. There is a well-established and detailed philosophy which demonstrates the links between human rights and people's needs. So that makes it a very strong and powerful measure. The Mexican government has freely signed uh, as well a number of international conventions on human rights, some of which are based on the original Mexican constitution, which has influenced around constitutions around the world. And these are international values now, not just Mexican values. And politicians and the public understand the concepts and language of rights. So it is high public acceptance. Now, 
I could spend 45 minutes praising the excellent work you have done. But that is not my job today. <laughs> my job today is because you are coming to a point of uh, updating and revising the measure to critically appraise its weaknesses as well as its strengths. So please take what I say in the context of what I have been asked to do. Yeah? Okay. So, why are human rights and the constitutional rights such a powerful and useful measure for measuring multidimensional poverty? As I said, uh, it represents the will of the Mexican people. But as Mary Robinson, the uh, former UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, has argued, a human rights approach adds value because it provides a framework of obligations that has a legal power to render governments accountable. So it is very useful because whoever is in power, their job is to uphold the constitution. It is not party political. Finally, a human rights approach to measuring poverty shifts the emphasis in the debates about poverty away from the failure of poor people. Uh, it is no longer about poor people behaving badly and should be trying harder. In a human rights perspective, poverty is often the cause by macroeconomic structures in society which disadvantage social groups of people. Hence, poverty in this context is no longer described as a social problem, but as a violation of rights. And policies made on that basis are much more effective at reducing poverty rather than policies that just blame the poor for their own poverty. Sorry. Additionally, the full package of human rights provides a lens through which poverty is seen as multidimensional, encompassing not only low income, but other forms of deprivation or loss of dignity. So as a framework, it mandates really a measurement of multidimensional poverty from a theoretical basis. Okay, so uh, you know the different indicators that are in the uh, law. Uh, let me talk about some of the ideas I will elaborate on in this, uh, uh, my, this discussion about some of the things I think uh, need to be, could be improved upon, and I will explain why I think they need to be improved upon. So the education indicator does not at the moment measure education quality. It's possible to complete basic education, not just in Mexico, but anywhere, and still have literacy and numeracy difficulties. The real education gap is not necessarily about how many years a child went to school, but what they learnt when they went to school. It's between those who come out of school with no qualifications compared with those who come out with high qualifications. The access to health and social security are more or less the same indicator. They tend to measure very similar things. And the access to health service indicator does not really measure whether people are can actually get healthcare when they need it. Uh, they may on paper have access, but if they live a long way from the nearest health facilities, or there are financial reasons they cannot access their healthcare, or maybe other reasons, then uh, you are, they, they, they cannot have the access that they have on paper. And it may be a good idea to have more robust measures of access to health services. The current thresholds of housing quality and housing services have become less reliable over time and do not really correspond the threshold values with the views of the Mexican population. There have been new constitutional rights since the uh, general law and social development were passed, such as the right to internet access, and that could be incorporated uh, within the uh, the measurement of poverty. And lastly, at the moment, children are treated as a property of their households, whereas it is clear that uh, children and adults may often have different needs. The needs of a 50-year-old man and a six-month-old baby girl 
are not identical. So it may be a good idea to incorporate child-specific measures to better measure the multidimensional poverty of children in Mexican society. Okay, so let me discuss the theory on which uh, the intersectional approach is based. So, it comes from the work of uh, my late lamented boss, who unfortunately died in 2009, uh, who defined poverty in terms of the concept of relative deprivation. He said, poverty can only be understood objectively in terms of this concept. Individuals, families and groups in the population can be said to be in poverty when they lack the resources to obtain the types of diet, participate in the activities and have in the living conditions and amenities which are customarily or widely approved of in the society in which they live. This is poverty defined in terms of citizenship that you do not have enough money and other resources to be able to participate as a full member of the society in which you live. You are excluded from having the normal possessions, you are excluded from being able to participate in the normal activities that most people would take for granted. So, in this conception of poverty, Poverty itself is a command over insufficient resources over time. You do not have enough money. And the outcome of poverty is deprivation or denial of fulfillment of rights. Yep. So, in this conception of poverty, we have income on one scale. We have standard of living or deprivation on the other. And the poor are those who have both a low income and a low standard of living. The not poor are those who have a high income and a, a high standard of living. And you can draw the uh, optimum poverty line at the point which maximizes the difference between these two groups and minimizes the difference between them. Oops. Sorry. Okay, so the concept of poverty is not static, it's dynamic. So the theory is that individuals and families whose resources fall seriously short of those commanded by the average individual family in the community of which they live are in poverty. So you know, poverty is something that's uh, very unpleasant, so people try very hard to get out of it. So at one point in time you may get a different measure of poverty than if you look at it longitudinally. So, here is a dynamic model of poverty. At the first time period zero, the person is not poor. They have a high income and a high standard of living. The way people often become poor is they have a catastrophic loss of income. They lose their job, they become sick and they can't work, their relationship breaks up and their income falls. However, their standard of living doesn't fall immediately. They may have access to social security, they may have some wealth, they may have friends to draw upon. So, you will get a group of people at time one who have a very low income, but their standard of living is still reasonably okay. If that income remains low for an extended period, their standard of living will eventually fall and they will be both low income and also suffer from deprivation. They will be multidimensionally poor. When way people often get out of poverty is their income rises quite rapidly. They get a new job, they form a new relationship, and so uh, their income will rise. But again, their standard of living does not rise immediately. It often takes time for them to move to a better accommodation or to buy the things they need. So there will be a smaller group of people whose income is high, but they still suffer from deprivations. But if their income remains high, then they will spend their way out of poverty. 
So we can update that original graph to have four groups. The original poor and not poor, but a group with a high standard of living and a low income who are sinking into poverty, and a smaller group with a high income but a low standard of living who are rising out of poverty. So you go from being not poor to poor by going to the left and then down, and you come out of poverty by going to the right and then up. Very few people cross the, go across the middle in a rich, relatively rich country like Mexico or the UK. So these are the interpretation of the four quadrants. Uh, there are other people who have uh, done similar uh, ways of dividing up a cross-sectional survey of poverty, Kazman in 2000, but they have a slightly different interpretation of the meaning of these groups. And so uh, the mo model of multidimensional poverty that Conival has used is related to these theoretical underpinnings. It has a basis in the a firm and well-established theory of poverty. Okay. So, it is important, of course, uh, to understand what Tony Atkinson said, that the best measure of poverty depends on the policy purpose of that measurement. The definition of a poverty indicator or poverty level or the unit analyses are not purely scientific or technical judgments. They involve judgments about the objectives of policy. And so it is very clear what the objectives are in uh, the Mexican measure. It is to help fulfill the social and economic rights of the population. Okay. So, does the multidimensional poverty measure need to be updated and revised? If it is, there is nothing wrong with it, there is no need to fix it, yeah? As the Americans would say, the US would say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay? So, the usefulness of a poverty measure or the measurement of any kind depends on three main factors. Whether it is suitable, are the indicators socially and culturally appropriate? Whether it's valid, uh, do the indicators actually measure poverty or are they measuring something else, happiness or well-being? Another way of putting this in statistical terms is, does your measurement of poverty contain a large amount of systematic er error? So instead of measuring poverty, it misses its target because of this error. And lastly, it's very important that any measurement is reliable. Will you obtain the same results if you repeat the measurement? So if you are measuring from one year to the next, how it changes over time due to real, real changes in the population, is it getting less poor, or is it just due to random error in the sample? Are you getting the same groups of people being identified as poor, or again, are you getting different groups of people being identified as poor because your measure has a large amount of random error? So, if you have a measurement of poverty that is suitable, valid, and reliable, then you have a good measurement. If it doesn't have these properties, then you don't have a good measurement. Is that clear? Okay, so I'm going to show you some work uh, uh, from one of my ex-PhD students, Yedith, who uh, worked for Conival for many years. Uh, she looked at the uh, validity of uh, the, uh, the measure at, at that time uh, in terms of how well each of the indicators correlated with groups in the population who are known from previous much research uh, to be more likely to be poor. And these are odds ratios. So she has shown here in the first column that if you are in a low socioeconomic strata in Mexico, you are 7.6 times more likely to have a low income than if you are in a high socioeconomic strata. You are 10.4 times more likely uh, not to have an internet connection in a low socioeconomic strata than a high socioeconomic strata. Similarly, she looked at it in terms of uh, indigenous populations living in rural areas 
who there is much research shows are more likely to be poor than say people uh, living in the cities and again you can see all the indicators uh, there are reasonable levels of validity there are some minor problems when looking at households with high dependency ratios for social security and healthcare but nevertheless most of the measures in the, the most of the indicators seem to be valid measures of poverty when we look at reliability the amount of random error in the measurement what we find this is a statistic called Cronbach's alpha highlighted in bold in 2008 it had a value of 0.62 but by 2016 that had declined to 0.53 now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. If you have an effective measure of policy of poverty and it is influencing policy, then the government will act and reduce the amount of deprivation and poverty in the country. And as you reduce the amount of poverty, so your measure becomes less reliable. It's a problem of success. It's also a problem, and it's predicted by relative deprivation theory, that as society changes, so measures which used to be good measures in the past become less effective. So in the UK, Charles Booth took data from the 1891 census, uh, and he measured poverty in terms of how many people were overcrowded in reform or people to a room, whether they had access to toilets and running water. Those measures are no longer useful in the UK because society has changed and governments have acted and improved housing and therefore they are no longer reliable <coughs> measures of poverty because they affect only a very small percentage of the population. But this gives a reason why it's necessary to update things over time because society evolves, things hopefully get better and therefore your measure becomes less reliable. There's more error incorporated into your measure. Now, you can use statistical techniques to get very good estimates of the amount of random error in the multidimensional poverty measure and also to look at which parts of the measure are robust and which parts of the measure are not so good. So this is a structural model. Uh, poverty is considered a latent variable. A latent variable is just the statistical term for an idea. You cannot measure poverty directly. You can't take a ruler and measure how poor someone is. You can only measure it indirectly using indicators. Yeah? So there are two sub-components of the multidimensional poverty measure, low income and social, social rights. Yeah. And those social rights are made up of a, a number of other uh, variables, education, health, social security, housing, basic services and food security. And there are different numbers of indicators in each of those sub-components. Yeah. So this is a mathematical way of looking at the Mexican multidimensional poverty measure. And you can get very accurate uh, estimates of what are the good parts of the measure and what are the not so good parts of the measure. So, this is called a confirmatory factor analysis model. And it is what is known as a reflective measurement model, where the indicators are causally related to the latent variable multidimensional poverty, i.e. when multidimensional poverty changes, the indicators will change. So, if poverty gets worse, food security will get worse. If poverty gets better, food security will get better, or education will get better, etc. This kind of model is very useful because it has some very desirable properties. It is not necessary in this kind of model to include all possible indicators of multidimensional poverty in order to get a good measurement. The indicators themselves are substitutable. You can take one out, put another one back in, 
and you will still get a good measurement of multidimensional poverty. It means it is a useful model in order to update your poverty measure as some of the indicators become less uh, useful. It also means you don't need an identical set of indicators over time. You can change the indicators and then use scale equating to uh, align the differences over time. This may sound a bit like uh, some kind of trick, but you have to remember that all of you have passed school exams. Yeah? You have done multiple choice questionnaires and other times of, of examinations. And the questions you were asked the year you took those exams will not be the same questions as the people uh, had the following year or the year before. But nevertheless, they measured your ability to understand history or geography or mathematics. And what the uh, education authorities do is they make sure that the past grades each year are equivalent using these kinds of methodologies. Otherwise, you could pass one year because you got lucky uh, with a lot of easy questions and another year you would fail because the questions were not were harder. So in order to get around that problem they align the differences. So you can get reliability statistics from these models called omega which is the best measure of reliability the amount of random error. Okay so what we find is that in 2008, uh, using all the indicators, there was a very high level of reliability, 0.92. That's the correlation between these indicators and the infinite perfect subset of indicators. Yeah. By 2018, that had fallen a bit to 0.88. So both were okay. However, most of the reliability in the social deprivation side of the measurement was due to the food security questions. Over 70% of it, and by 2018, 75% of the reliability of the social rights element of the multidimensional poverty measure is due to the food security questions. So it is heavily reliant on those. If we look in using an item response theory model, what you want in a good measure is for the items uh, to uh, fall between zero and one. Zero is the average standard of living, average fulfillment of social rights in the Mexican population. Uh, three is three standard deviations away from the average. Beyond three sigma, beyond three standard deviations, measurement becomes unreliable because it affects only one in a thousand households. And even though the ENIG is a large survey, it's very hard for it to measure something that affects one in a thousand. Yeah? So, as you could see in 2008, there are only three indicators which were unreliable because they would be on three standard deviations. You have three, three standard deviations poorer than the average uh, uh, person in Mexico. If you didn't have electricity or problems with the walls and roofs as it was currently measured. By 2018, you can see that a lot more variables are now uh, very rare. They are beyond three standard deviations and fewer variables are between zero and three standard deviations. So many of the indicators which didn't contain a lot of random error in 2008, in 2018, now they're very difficult to measure because so few people are suffering those things. That's a good thing. It means those problems are being solved, yeah? But it's not a good thing if you want to keep the same indicators in your measure. Yeah? You need to adapt the thresholds or change the indicators to reflect the new reality. Okay. So, you can not only measure how severe uh, each of the indicators are in terms of how far below the average a person who suffers from that indicator is, you can also look at how good those indicators are at identifying who is multidimensionally poor and who is not multidimensionally poor. 
So what you want is a high discrimination to the right of the line. And in 2008, you can see uh, most of the indicators fell to the right of the vertical line. They were good at sector identifying who was poor and who wasn't. By 2018, virtually all the indicators that were good at discriminating the poor from the not poor were the food security measures. So many of the other indicators now have a, are not very discriminatory and they only affect a very few people. The reason they're not very discriminatory is because they are only affect, affecting a few people. I hope that's clear. Okay, so Conival, of course, doesn't use all the indicators. It aggregates them into the six dimensions. And when you aggregate them into the six dimensions and just have the same score for each dimension, the reliability falls was 0.75 in 2008 and falls to 0.68 in 2018. And that's below the critical threshold that's generally used in social sciences for a reliable measure. So these omega analyses give a similar result to the Combax Alpha analyses I showed you from Yedith's work. This work is based on, uh, uh, again, one of my ex-PhD students, Hector Najera, who's very kindly run these analyses. Okay, so let's have a look at the threshold levels that were used for each indicator, because as you can see, some of them are now very unreliable. So, in social sciences, uh, we often consider deprivation to be a continuum. You can have no deprivation or extreme deprivation, and there's mild, moderate, severe thresholds. Rights are often thought of as binary. Either a judge says you have your rights fulfilled or doesn't, but in a social science context, you can also think of rights as going for complete fulfillment to extreme violation of rights. And this is how you can relate fulfillment of rights with, with deprivation. So, the thresholds are set in the current multidimensional poverty measure using legal criteria, uh, legal norms if they exist, like the judicial threshold I showed you, or where they don't exist with consultation with specialists or by expert criteria uh, from public institutions. What isn't done is to set those thresholds by consulting the Mexican people. It's all set by experts. Sorry? Yeah, okay, so you can get so. As uh, <laughs> you were saying, you consulted the Mexican people. Here's the results of that consultation in 2007. Uh, you can see that uh, for a large number of deprivation indicators, say, have it to, whether it's necessary for people to have a fridge. 94% uh, of the Mexican population thought this was a good indicator of deprivation. There is quite a strong agreement across society. Uh, if a man sort of thinks something is necessary, a woman is also likely to think it's necessary. Even those who think they have enough money, compared to those who don't think they don't have enough money, there is strong agreement on what are the necessary things. Although those who have enough money say everything is slightly more necessary than those who don't. But you can see the pattern is very similar. There is a consensus in the Mexican population about what are necessary things to have in order to live decently. Uh, and that is these cuts across society. However you divide it, young versus old, uh, low social class, high social class, men, women, rural, urban, you get very similar patterns. When you compare uh, what the population think with what the threshold values were set at, what you find is that the population has a much higher, more generous threshold. So. Uh, the population were asked in that 2007 survey, what is the minimum educational attainment that a person should have nowadays to live decently? 
the multidimensional poverty measure threshold was secondary level or less, but 90% of the Mexican population argued it would be higher. Similarly, when you look at uh, what are necessary flooring, walls and roof and materials in order to live decently, 80% of the population said you should have brick walls, but the threshold is set at wood or roofing boards. Yeah. Again, 80% said you needed solid concrete roof or uh, slabs on the roof, whereas uh, the threshold is set at uh, sheet metal or asbestos. Similarly, for drainage and water supply services to the dwelling, 98% says you need exclusive use of the toilet, 90% say you need pipe water in the dwelling, 94% said you need water supply every day, and 84% you need water supply for 24 hours. But only one indicator is used, which is pipe water into the plot. So for many of these housing services, the thresholds that have been set by expert consultation are much lower than the views of the Mexican population. They're not necessarily socially realistic. If you adopt socially realistic thresholds, then uh, you can see the changes in the percentage who are deprived uh, using the Conival uh, uh, thresholds in the measure compared to this consensual approach of taking what the, the majority of the population think should be necessary to live decently. And you can see there are some percentage changes. Uh, access to information, access to the internet has been added because that was a new constitutional right which wasn't there at the time. But you can see it does not make a huge difference, but it would probably make for much more reliable measures if you use that for the update. So, uh, Hector Najera and his PhD looked at uh, measuring multidimensional poverty in Mexico for young people and he made a number of recommendations on uh, what could be done in order to improve uh, the methodology. He said you should use a minimum social protection floor measure uh, in 2012. The Mexican government and indeed all the governments of the world as well as the employers organizations as well as the trade unions in Mexico agreed to a minimum social protection floor and maybe since there is this agreement between the unions, the employers and the government that would be a good way of updating the social security measure argued they should use less severe thresholds for measuring deprivation of roofing materials, wall materials, and um, water deprivation, and we've seen why uh, that argument is, is powerful. Uh, the electricity indicator is unreliable. It was unreliable, not very reliable in 2008. In 2018, virtually everyone has electricity. It adds no extra information to include that in the, uh, the measure it can be dropped. And lose less for severe thresholds for food deprivation. Okay, so I'll come to my conclusions. And these are, of course, open for discussion. This is just me looking from the outside and uh, looking at some of the um, scientific analyses of uh, the excellent multidimensional poverty measure, but if you are revising it, then you need uh, some ideas on what could be done to possibly improve it. So I think you should develop an improved measure of education deprivation, which incorporates indicators of the quality of education, not just how many years children go to school, but what they learn. I think the access to health and social security indicators are largely the same and they have a few re validity and some reliability problems and in particular uh, there are good measures of health service access that could be adopted. The social security indicator could be updated to take uh, account of the minimum social protection floor agreement. You can adopt socially more socially realistic uh, 
thresholds for housing quality and housing services. Uh, these are ones that correspond to the views of the Mexican people and would be a more reliable way of, of measuring those services. There are new constitutional rights like internet access which could be included and uh, there's a need to develop, I'm reading the wrong thing aren't I? Uh, sorry. Let me go back. I'll go back to this one first. So, the reliability of the official measure of multidimensional poverty has decreased over time. I'm sorry. The decline in reliability is the prediction of the relative deprivation theory as science is progressive, so living conditions improve. The housing and basic service indicators have been affected the most by this decline in reliability. And the increasingly low reliability of these dimensions affects the overall reliability of the multidimensional poverty measure. Deprivation thresholds are likely to be more adequate when they correspond with the views of the Mexican people. They improve the suitability. The food security dimension is the most reliable. And there's an increasing need to update the multidimensional poverty measure. And so if I go on to the last one, which I was discussing just now, the way I think these challenges can be met, as I said, is to develop the improved measures of education, to include new constitutional rights, as I said, and develop child-specific indicators to better reflect the needs of children and adults. Okay, uh, time is up, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias al profesor Gordon. Eh, vamos a pasar a una ronda inicial de reflexiones eh, con el doctor Fernando Cortés para después pasar a una sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Gracias, eh, buenas tardes. Voy a hablar en español porque ya le pasé a Dave el texto en inglés de manera tal que él ya conoce lo que voy a decir. Bueno, antes que nada, agradezco la oportunidad que me da el Coneval y las personas de su secretario general, el doctor José Nabor, y el DGA de pobreza que se me escapó. Ricardo Aparicio, de moderar los intercambios de puntos de vista que, se, que suscitará a raíz de las ideas que nos acaba de presentar el doctor Gordon. Pero antes de iniciar la sesión de preguntas y respuestas, voy a tomarme la libertad de desarrollar un par de, de ideas que emergen de la presentación. La medida multidimensional de pobreza que el Coneval publicó hace 10 años, en diciembre de 2009, como todo, ha envejecido con el paso del tiempo. El coeficiente alfa de Cronbach pasó de 0.62 en 2008 a 0.53 en 2016, y omega de punto 92 a punto 88 entre 2008 y 2018. Aunque casi tres cuartas partes de este índice es explicado por el acceso a la alimentación. El envejecimiento se explica no solo porque las canastas alimentarias y no alimentarias cambian con el tiempo, sino también debido a que la propia política social tiende a reducir la varianza de algunas variables, como sería el caso, por ejemplo, del piso de tierra y la electricidad, como se vio en la presentación. Entonces, dejan de ser variables, pasan prácticamente a ser constantes y por consiguiente ya prácticamente no sirven. 
Es por ello que el Coneval decidió en 2009 que la medida debía revisarse cada 10 años. De hecho, en poco tiempo más, daremos a conocer la nueva serie de pobreza, así como un sistema con información complementaria que incluye, entre otras, variables que registran la calidad de la educación. Esperamos que las medidas de confiabilidad vuelvan a subir como en el pasado. Cada vez que hay cambios en la medición de la pobreza, surge la pregunta de si el nuevo dato es comparable con los anteriores. No hay que olvidar que si bien interesa saber la gravedad del problema, no es menos importante conocer su evolución. Cada vez que publicamos alguna cifra, van y miran, bajó o subió. ¿No? Y está más bajo o más alto que cuando. O sea, la parte temporal es bien importante. Para tratar este tópico tenemos dos grandes avenidas. Una es el análisis de la invarianza factorial en el modelo, en el ámbito de los modelos de ecuaciones estructurales. Y la otra son los equating tests en el dominio de las pruebas de hipótesis. O sea, hay formas para tratar estos problemas. Esto es nuevo y se lo voy a meter de contrabando. Creo que el aporte que está haciendo Bristol, liderado por Dave, es traer al campo de la medición los avances que ha tenido la teoría de la medición, cuyos orígenes se remontan que fines del siglo XIX, comienzo del siglo XX, y que fueron muy desarrollados por los psicólogos sociales, por ahí por los años 20, cuando empezaron a preocuparse por problemas que no podían observar directamente, sino que las manifestaciones psicológicas de los problemas psicológicos que los individuos tenían. Estos mismos psicólogos sociales, junto con los educólogos, son los que los, en los años 30 abandonaron la posibilidad de usar la experimentación para mejorar los problemas sociales. Desarrollaron los experimentos eh, de manera espectacular. Entonces, ¿qué nos está entregando la, la escuela de, de Bristol? Nos está entregando un modelo, un esquema, dentro del cual podemos de, discutir los problemas de medición. Podemos discutir si entra o no entra tal indicador y si el umbral está muy bajo o está muy alto. ¿Cuál es el umbral adecuado para tener una buena medición de pobreza? Pero lo que tenemos es un modelo para discutir. Y aquí cada vez que aparecía el acceso a la alimentación, miraba a Ricardo, porque, como sabemos, desde los campos de la nutrición y de la economía, se han desatado fuertes críticas al índice de acceso a la alimentación, que resulta que, dentro de la teoría de la medición, tiene una fortaleza y estar sosteniendo la confiabilidad y la validez de la medición. La crítica más fuerte es que se le acusa de ser subjetivo. Especialmente por las dos primeras preguntas. No que ahí se concentran y por eso el, el ataque es que no es una medición objetiva, sino subjetiva. Por, eso, por ello, a mí no me deja de llamar la atención que el índice y sus componentes son bastante confiables y que gran parte de la confiabilidad de la medición 
y del índice de carencia se debe al acceso a la alimentación. Lo que estaría indicando que la discusión que se hizo, que la discusión que viene de los otros campos disciplinarios, eh, se hizo en el aire sin tener un modelo que permitiera llegar a una decisión clara de qué estaba midiendo, si era un buen indicador o no. Y para cerrar, quisiera yo tomar otra de las ideas de la teoría de la medida. La teoría de la medición, lo que nos dice, o, o como está planteado, es que un concepto inobservable, o una variable latente, como se llama en estadística, puede dar origen a, infinitas, a infinitos indicadores. Son todos indicadores del mismo concepto. Y uno puede tomar muestras aleatorias de esos indicadores, y los indicadores pueden ser todos distintos, el conjunto de indicadores seleccionados puede ser distintos, pero todos están apuntando exactamente al mismo concepto. Esta es una idea que eh, es difícil de procesar. Y cada vez que nosotros hacemos algún cambio en un indicador, siempre está el problema y se, seguirá siendo comparable o ahora vamos a, hacer, eh, vamos a tener una, un cambio debido al artefacto, al aparato de medición. Entonces, estos temas todos, y por esto agradezco a Dave la eh, presentación muy clara y muy organizada, porque nos da un montón de ideas, como decía José Nabor, respecto a cómo podemos seguir trabajando en Coneval para mejorar. Gracias. Ahora pasamos... a la sesión de preguntas y respuestas donde yo tendré que moderar. Entonces, eh, por favor. Um, ¿En inglés? Sí. Yes, it's okay. It's okay. Possible. Yes, of course. Um, thank you, Professor Gordon, for a very interesting and, and Uh, illustrating uh, presentation. Um, I work for the Poverty Analysis Unit and my question is uh, regarding the rights-based approach. So um, in Coneval we've been using firstly the law as the main guideline and uh, in a rather strict way. Um, for example, we took um, the indicators that the law establishes that we should uh, use as dimensions when the law does not require for us to do that. Um, so it was kind of our guideline to build uh, the, the measure. Then we're moving towards using the rights-based approach, the, the United Nations rights-based approach, for the creating new indicators that will um, complement the measure in a new system uh, of indicators that will not substitute but but go w together with a with a poverty measure but my question is that or my concern is that the rights based approach seems to be a good conceptual framework or maybe a good general guideline for us to check whether we're including the important things and we're having the right focus on the problem. But it's not a very good um, methodology for creating indicators that will measure poverty because it requires many things that are not strictly necessary to, to measure adequately uh, poverty, such as um, you in, in a rights-based approach, you would need indicators of availability and accessibility and quality all together. And maybe that's not needed for a good poverty measure because you could do with a lot less indicators and, and choosing only a few of them which uh, result in a better uh, measure. So my question would be, what are your thoughts on keeping the rights-based approach as a guideline for creating new 
indicators or whether we should be following a different methodology and keeping the rights-based approach as the conceptual framework or, or as a more general uh, guideline. Thank you. Tomamos, what, what do you prefer? I'm happy to. Okay. And that's an excellent question. I, uh, I think the rights-based approach is extremely powerful. It's obviously part of the law. Uh, it's easily understood by the population and by, more importantly, by policymakers. Um, so I think it's very important to keep a rights-based approach. Uh, but you don't need to measure everything. Uh, as I showed you, uh, many of the indicators are substitutable if you're using a rights-based approach to measure poverty. So you need indicators which, give, which are sufficient to give you a valid and reliable measure of poverty, i.e. to contain a, a minimum amount of error. So that uh, when you say uh, 30% of the population are poor, it's plus or minus 3%, not plus or minus 40%. Yeah. So it's obviously better to have now lower errors than higher errors. Uh, you can incorporate different indicators to improve the reliability because as I showed you it's been declining over time. You can include new rights as they become included in the constitution. Um, you don't need to measure everything in order to have a good measurement of poverty. One of the major advances of, in statistics uh, in the 20th century was the proof that you don't have to measure the infinite set of poverty indicators in order to get a reliable and valid measure of poverty. You just have to have a sufficient set of indicators. So I think that you should keep the right space approach. I think the measure needs updating uh, with some new indicators or indicators with different thresholds. Uh, but I think it's a very powerful and very attractive framework to have a rights based approach uh, for what, the whole set of reasons I gave previously in my talk. Thank you very much. Alguien más? Jadit. Uh, luego... Thank you very much, Dave, for uh, clearing up our thoughts. Um, we know that every party definition has a policy content. Therefore, the measurement of poverty serves to inform social policy. We also know that Coneval has advocated a human or social, social rights-based approach and estimates the intersection approach to poverty, but also estimates other poverty measures. Which of these measures will you recommend to social policy makers if we know that deprivations are the denial of social rights? So again, thank you, Yedith. That's an excellent question. So I, I phrase my questions now. Yes. Thank you very much, Doctor, by your presentation. Very interesting, very reflexive for me. I have three, I don't say uh, precisely questions, but uh, reflections too. You have presented uh, the dynamics of poverty in an interesting way where you show that if the income decreases, it is not reflected immediately in the well-being. No? Mm -hmm. But here in the um, indicators of the measurement of, this, of Mexican uh, multidimensional poverty measurement, we have structural and we have conjunctural, conjunctural uh, indicators. We have the indicators that can change uh, immediately, but some of them will not change, never. For instance, no, we have, for example, the education level. When you reach uh, six, nine, ten years of education, that uh, will not be uh, lost. So 
this type of indicators uh, will not uh, be reflected in the in this uh, uh, dy uh, dynamics. No. So, what you recommend about that? Maybe you should uh, divide the indicators between those that are not uh, structural. Mm -hmm. The second question is related to the uh, human rights approach. Um, I believe that um, we need also to incorporate uh, another question uh, related with how uh, much, uh, how many uh, the privations you have to consider to be poor in the uh, human rights approach, because the human rights approach defines uh, some principles, and one of them is uh, the, the fact that the, the, the rights are not, uh, cannot be divided. No? So, for, for my point of view, if you use that uh, approach, you must define the threshold in a, a zero-based, no? zero-based zone. Or, or you have a deprivation, so you are not a, in a state of guarantee of all the rights, or you have at least one. No? So if you use this approach, you should uh, analyze that, no? what you recommend on that. And the third question is uh, about the, the reliability of the indicators. No? It's true. Uh, when you analyze, for example, the access to electricity, the electricity is almost universal, so that indicator does not... Uh, is not useful for this, no? But the people who does not have this electricity is a very important uh, target, no? Th we should not uh, forget that population. No? So what I believe is that uh, this measure of reliability issues uh, is ref uh, referred to the, uh, to the fact that we measure with a survey. If we have a, a census, that doesn't apply. Or, or, or does, does it apply? That, that's the question, no? Because if you have a census, you, you can measure anything. But the, the fact is that if you uh, start uh, moving these indicators, you lose the fact that you can uh, compare between years. And uh, the final purpose of this type of measurements, at least here in Mexico, as I interpret that correctly, is to see how the poverty is reducing with the uh, policy, uh, uh, social policy. So in this case, these type of reflections are in conflict. No? So what do you think about that? No, that's, that's the question. Thank you. Okay. Another one? Yeah? Uh, I have another question. Uh, I understand, I think I understand um, like the benefits of measuring poverty through a latent variable and because and also the associated uh, interchangeability of indicators. But uh, what I have seen sometimes is that the general public and policy makers benefit from observing a very disaggregated dimensions dimensions of poverty. So I'm not sure how, uh, if, for example, if they start measuring poverty through this latent variable, and maybe they do approximate uh, poverty in a more, um, more independent way of the indicators and their flaws and deviations, like, how can you provide uh, policy makers and po general public uh, the, um, how, um, the detailed aspects of how people experience poverty? Okay. There are some really good questions. Uh, the first one, Yedith asked about uh, what advice I would give to policy makers. As I said, I think the constitutional framework is really important. Uh, 
Yeah, I couldn't give that advice to my own country because we don't have a constitution. <laughs> but, but in countries which have followed the Mexican example, and that is many countries in the world, and incorporated socio and economic rights into their uh, own constitutions, then it's a very useful framework for countries like my, my own, which uh, uh, haven't done so, then using a consensual deprivation approach where you uh, use the views of the public in order to see what is uh, should be incorporated into the poverty measure is a uh, very powerful approach. And the combined methodology, uh, as we have done work with UNICEF, uh, which uh, incorporates the views of the public into the uh, definitions of measurement of poverty, but also in the broader human rights framework is, a, is, a, is probably the one which will have the most support and the most impact from that point of view. You are quite correct, education level at the individual uh, as it's currently measured is fixed. I guess in theory it's meant to be measured at the household level, so if uh, a household becomes less poor maybe the younger children will stay on, on the more school, so it will vary a bit. But the best measure of educational uh, uh, rights being fulfilled is to uh, have a measure of education quality, not just in childhood, but across uh, across your across your life, yeah? the idea of lifelong learning, I think, is important in all countries, and so acquiring new skills, particularly as society evolves and computer technology makes some jobs redundant and makes other jobs uh, more applicable, will become increasingly important. And I think the poverty measure needs to adapt, particularly in a, an area like education to not just the current situation but what's going to happen in the future and the nature of work is going to change. Human rights, uh, how many rights are needed to be poor? Obviously in a human rights framework uh, uh, having one right unfulfilled is, 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 is bad uh, and, and therefore the threshold is set at one or more. However, as I showed, when looking from a social science perspective, uh, rights are not necessarily considered to be binary, but from complete fulfilment to extreme unfulfillment. And so where you put the threshold is important, or you can have a, a measure of how much of your right has been fulfilled. It's not necessarily uh, the concept of rights is not necessarily a purely binary thing. It's often indicated that way and sometimes we incorporate it that way, but you can have levels of different fulfilment of rights. Uh, I didn't go into the detail of that because I, I would have been here for a lot longer. <laughs> Uh, reliability, as you said, uh, if you don't have electricity, that's really important. Um, but it, the reality is it makes no difference whether you include that or not in the indicator because it's measured from a survey. If it was measured from a census, that would be different. But where you are uh, only measuring a few tens of thousands of households, uh, there are so few households left with no access to electricity that you are not going to get many in the survey. So you add maybe two people on one indicator and if you don't have electricity you will not have a lot of your other rights being fulfilled. So it really would make absolutely no difference even at two or three decimal places to the, the, the answer you get. You can leave it in if you want but it, 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 it is not, not adding anything to your measure. Um, it's important to be able to compare over years, but it's also important that your measure doesn't become more and more error prone. So the best way is to update your measure so that the error is reduced and then scale equate so that you can see what a being poor in 
2020 is in terms of how poor you were in 2008. So how many deprivations you suffered from, how low your income was. Uh, and as I said, that's done all the time by the education specialists, uh, by psychologists when comparing tests over time. It's not uh, adding new techniques needed. Uh, all of you have uh, passed exams based on scale equating and the pass mark was set that way. So you know, it's not something that, that's difficult to do or unknown. Uh, yeah. So it's important to be able to compare over time, but it's important that your, in order to compare over time, that your measure doesn't get increasingly become less valid and less reliable. Because if some of the indicators are becoming less valid, then you're not necessarily measuring poverty as it used to be measured. So the change in the, the errors in the measure are inevitable, particularly as society changes, and if you want to be able to compare strictly over time, although it may seem intuitive, you keep the same variables, the reality is you sometimes need to change those variables in order to make a valid comparison over time. Otherwise you're comparing in 2008, let's say, if you had a poverty rate of 20% plus or minus 2%, and in 2018 it would be 19% or 15% plus or minus 15%, you don't know whether things have changed or not. So comparing over time sometimes requires you to change what you measure in order for the comparison to be effective, even though that seems entirely counterintuitive, I understand that. Latent variable, substitutability, um, this, it's really important to be able to disaggregate dimensions. I agree entirely, as I said, uh, the best policy poverty measures are ones that are policy relevant and one of the strengths of the uh, Mexican methodology is it has all these different dimensions which different branches of government are responsible for. So I remember when this methodology was first adopted, prior to that poverty was really the uh, something to do with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, the Ministry of Social Security. It was a shock to the Ministry of Health, Education and Housing that poverty was something to do with them. Yeah. I think they responded well to that and it's really important that those groups continue to respond because the way people live is affected by lots of different branches of government and therefore being able to disaggregate and pull out your measurement to show the ministry in charge of housing that there's a problem here or uh, education there's a problem there is of crucial importance and that's one of the great strengths of uh, the Mexican measure. I mean I, I said I wasn't going to I could have spent the whole talk talking about its strengths and that really is one of them but that doesn't preclude a latent variable approach because at the end of the day you also want a measure of whether multidimensional poverty is going up and down so you need to do both hence the, the model uh, I showed you that uh, Hector had kindly run the analyses for. So I hope that answers your question. Primero quisiera mencionar que todo el marco conceptual de la visión de pobreza que David nos presentó está plasmado en su capítulo del libro sobre metodología de medición multidimensional de la pobreza que editó el Coneval junto con el Colegio de México. Ahí se puede consultar y es, el, es muy sólido, muy, muy, muy fuerte. Eh, I, I would like to mention... Dave, some issues. First, that uh, there are a number of institutional issues, not just methodological, technical issues. When you want the poverty measurement to be used for uh, influencing decision making, and I think that is important, and to be used uh, uh, of course, there are a number of methodological and technical issues that you have pointed out and that we greatly acknowledge as usual 
as it has always been when we participate in this uh, work with Coneval. Uh, and, but I, I, I would like to mention something about the feasibility of the measures. Uh, because when we made a criticism of the Mexican measurement, uh, we often uh, forget that the, one of the strengths of the Mexican poverty measurement is to have it at the municipality level. That allows a very powerful tool for a guiding a policy. But it also implies a number of restrictions on data availability. And uh, I would like to know your reflections on this because uh, since we have to use the census data and the, the number of the questions in the census is 30 questions and 75 questions on the survey of the census, then we have not been able to include and to incorporate some of the measures that we have at the survey, but that we do not have included into our measurement, not because they are not in the survey, but because they are not on the census. Uh, however, uh, the last point I would like to remark is the a very important issue in, in my point of view, which is what would be the basic thresholds to be considered. We have used our legal norms based on the laws. We have talked about with the uh, people who work at the National Household Housing Commission, for example. But we can see clearly from our threshold surveys that these thresholds are quite low, and not only quite low, but increasingly less reliable. Uh, and then how can we change our thresholds since it becomes of course, an institutional and political issue. I think that we can do it, and I think the Coneval is uh, compelled to discuss and to do this, and we have a window time for five years to complete this. <laughs> but, <laughs> It's not an easy task, I, 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 I think. And um, finally, uh, I would like to thank you very much and to invite you and all our colleagues because at Coneval, the Dr. Cruz and our academic investigators have commanded us to start on a new discussion issues which we will be working on on the following years in order to get a better, not just a better uh, measure of poverty, but a better measurement of social rights of those issues which cannot be incorporated in our measurement of poverty. Thank you for those excellent questions. I completely agree with you, measuring poverty should never just be an academic exercise. Its main purpose is to influence decision making in order to effectively eradicate poverty. If Conival is successful, you will need to find other jobs because there will be no more poverty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that would be a good thing. You would all be happy, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so, uh, the visibility of the measures is crucial. The public acceptability and political acceptability of the measures is crucial. 
and also being able to disaggregate down to municipal level is also extremely important because decision making isn't just made at national federal level it's also made at local level and local level decision making and not just policy but practice at local level can have huge impacts on people's lives uh, as you say the census is always going to be restricted to a few questions and therefore you're always going to have to do some modeling from the survey data and incorporate the information in the survey data with the census data. When you first tried to do this uh, 10 years ago, um, there was a lot of academic research but not very much practice. But over the past decade there has been tremendous advances in small area estimation methods, uh, empirical Bayesian and by, uh, prediction methods. Uh, there's also been improvements in geographically weighted regression which allow you to take information you have at higher levels and extrapolate them down to district levels. So along with the advances in computer uh, speeds it's now easier to do robust measurement at small area level but in order to do that you need to have a measure of multi-dimensional poverty which has low errors. If you have a lot of error in your measure of poverty you are not going to get a good model at small municipal level. So in order to get good estimates at municipal level which will influence policy because they're believed you need to reduce the error in in the survey measure in the, uh, and that's of crucial importance. So the, the two are not antagonistic, they're complementary. Now, I am, it's easy for me, I'm an academic from another country to say you should do this. I have no responsibility, I'm busy. Of course I understand the, the, the constraints you work upon in order to, when setting thresholds that these are enshrined in laws in different ministries and professional bodies. But nevertheless, as I said, if they're causing a lot of error in the measurement, if the population don't believe that these are, these, these, if they think the thresholds are too severe, then it becomes less acceptable to both the public and policy makers. So it's a debate you will have to have with your colleagues in other parts of, uh, of the government. Uh, I hope you win that debate. <laughs> it's easy for me to say. Thank you. ¿Hay alguna otra pregunta ya? Bueno, entonces, eh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Dave, for, uh, por tu presentación. Muchas gracias a ustedes por eh, haber eh, venido. Espero que esta plática les eh, motive a eh, mejorar eh, nuestra medida dentro de los límites que planteó muy claramente Ricardo. Es decir, un, un mundo es el de la academia, otro mundo es el de la política, y como ustedes saben, nuestra medición es ley. Entonces, eh, tenemos que hacer lo mejor que podamos dentro de las restricciones legales que tenemos. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Como un comentario de cierre, me parece que eh, estamos, eh, y que me faltó mencionar al inicio, fuimos muy afortunados en Coneval los últimos dos meses en tener aquí en nuestra casa a, a representantes de dos de las corrientes teóricas más relevantes a nivel mundial en cuanto a los estudios de pobreza y medición de pobreza. 
lo recordamos muy bien, hace un par de meses tuvimos la escuela de verano de OFI con los doctores Foster y Sabina Kid. El día de hoy tenemos al profesor Gordon. Y me parece que justo la provocación, yo lo diría en esos términos, la provocación que nos pone sobre la mesa el profesor Gordon nos dará pie, sin lugar a dudas, a... a retomar la, la, la discusión un tanto teórica, eh, creo que Fernando lo focalizó muy bien en cuanto a, son variables componentes de los indicadores que se han tornado un tanto constantes y que eso ha afectado la parte de la variabilidad del propio indicador es una discusión técnica estadística evidentemente pero también creo que parte de las intervenciones de, de, de los colegas hablaban sobre, pues, al final del día este tipo de cuestiones técnicas no nos deben de quitar nosotros desde Coneval como eh, el ente gubernamental autónomo que exhibe de manera oficial los indicados de su pobreza me parece que lo tenemos claro son personas, son agentes que de alguna manera no están teniendo la efectividad de sus derechos humanos, de sus derechos sociales en cuanto a las carencias de la vivienda y la caracterización de la propia vivienda pero evidentemente me parece que en esta parte de está la academia las discusiones académicas, está la parte de los políticos y de los asociadores de política pública, de alguna manera Coneval está en medio de esa discusión Estamos en medio y evidentemente una de las tareas y que en parte ya lo mencionaba también Fernando y también Ricardo, me parece y yo estoy convencido que la plataforma de indicadores de derechos sociales con énfasis de derechos humanos que muy próximamente daremos a conocer desde Coneval, no solamente va a constituir un complemento a la medición multidimensional, sino me parece que el, el reto de consolidar de manera estatal y nacional una serie de 45 indicadores con este enfoque, sin lugar a dudas, no solamente nos dará luz de manera interna de cuáles podrán ser las siguientes líneas de investigación en cuanto al mejoramiento o a la actualización de la propia medición oficial multidimensional, sino que también me parece que nos pondrá nuevamente en la vanguardia a nivel nacional y a nivel internacional de la presentación de esta plataforma de indicadores de derechos sociales. Eh, Concluyo nuevamente agradeciendo mucho al profesor David Gordon estar aquí. Muchísimas gracias también a Fernando por las gestiones para que el profesor nos pudiera visitar. Y me parece que sin lugar a dudas también el área de pobreza, la paloma también la parte de organización. Y bueno, creo, estoy convencido que tendremos muchas reflexiones, muchas horas de discusión a partir de esta muy interesante provocación que nos dejó el profesor Gordon el día de hoy. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much.